program manager on the PowerShell team. And I'm Mark Gray. I'm a program manager on the PowerShell team as well. We're not a single program manager. We're actually two different program managers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you're using any version of PowerShell, uh, there is something I must have done there because I've been doing PowerShell for almost nine years now. So except version one, I've done some features in every, every, every release so far. And uh, Mark has done GP in the past, and he made sure to <laughs> and he makes sure that whatever we are doing with BSC, we don't make any mistakes or whatever we learn from GP, we are up there. So don't ask him GP questions, but BSC questions are fine. Um, the overall idea of this session is basically we'll, we'll go through all the uh, new features we have done in version 5 of PowerShell and see how it w helps in moving to the DevOps world. And in the end, you hopefully you get that with PowerShell you get simplified IT automation, you get things faster, done faster, and you can use it across a various a set of uh, environments. Um, we have a couple of slides, so there are first few slides have more content, but then it's all demos are close to that. Um, so if you look at how things are happening today, you have things are moving to cloud, the scale, and things are getting difficult. So when you have to do those do those things at scale and complex stuff, you want things to be simplified. So the requirement is simplicity. The other piece is about things are turning fast. Everybody is moving to DevOps. Checkings are happening multiple times a day, and multiple releases are coming, as you can see with PowerShell as well. Um, so you need velocity. And the last piece is about heterogeneous environment. And you can think it up from both the sides, Windows versus Linux or on-prem versus cloud versus hybrid. So there are those notion of ubiquity. So if you look at those three themes or pillars, you will see in version five, you have something or the other which plays in those areas. Uh, simplicity is DSC, nothing new in five. Uh, from a DSC, is, it was introduced in four, but there's more features than. And the other big thing is classes. And how many of you have heard about classes in version five. Good, Jeffrey, you can pay your hand too. <laughs> <laughs> and how many of you have played with classes, actually did it? Okay, <laughs> thank you, Jeffrey. Um, from a velocity perspective, you'll see that PowerShell releases are coming faster. Um, we have more uh, work with community code sharing and um, from an authoring perspective and writing code better and faster, you'll see there's some improvements in ISE. And lastly, uh, PowerShell platform is being used a lot. If you look at Azure Automation, if you look at uh, Release Manager, any place you look, people are trying to build on what PowerShell platform provides. So it's not just a GUI shell that you are, uh, not GUI, a command shell that you're using by yourself, but people are building. And as well as PowerShell everywhere from a context of whether it's Azure, whether it's Office, whether it's Windows Server, you'll see more and more usage. As one thing I, I've seen is uh, five, six, seven years ago, when I meet somebody, say, oh, long time no see, what team are you working with? I'm like, I'm in Windows Server uh, project called PowerShell. I'm like, what is PowerShell? I had to go and explain six, seven years ago. Now, I don't even say I'm working in Windows Server, I, just says, I work on PowerShell. Wow, everybody in Microsoft also kind of <laughs> so it's not outside only. Um, uh, so what, we've talked about simplicity, velocity, and all of that kind of stuff, and we're also going to talk about how that kind of ties into the DevOps world, and we just wanted to give you a couple quick bullets on what we're talking about when we're talking about DevOps. I mean, we're talking about the concept of dev and IT, or operations working together, mm -hmm. we're talking about operations adopting the agile type of um, practices that Dev has had in the past and then the tooling and everything like that that goes along with it. Um, so we'll talk about uh, DSC and PowerShell as a platform, um, but obviously there are tools and things like that that can make use of that that we will allude to but not necessarily talk about today. Okay, so the other way we, we have looked at all the functionality there are in PowerShell 5, they allow you to do this circle of you author stuff, you test things, you deploy, you figure out there's some change, you go back to the authoring stage, and then again test it. So that's the high-level theme of 
if you look at various components as being done in PowerShell 5, you can put them in one of those three categories at uh, all this. So we'll, we'll look from an authoring perspective as an author, what things you can do. Um, so as an author, one big thing is about PowerShell Gallery. How many of you have gone to the PowerShell Gallery or used install module? Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that, that was a big shift when we started with DSC resource kit model, now everything is galleries. Uh, you will see every month or so we have a blog post saying, oh, the code in gallery has these version changes. So that's kind of released uh, rest kit. Uh, we have support for modules there. And soon uh, we are going to introduce support for scripts as well. So that's something uh, to keep in mind. I'm not announcing anything at this point, but that's something coming down the line. And obviously you have finding and acquiring stuff and uh, support for intern gal internal galleries. Uh, tomorrow there is a session that Krishna is doing. I'll try to show. We have written a couple of DSC resources and configuration to set up internal gallery. That's still work in progress, so it's not finished completely to be available on GitHub or PowerShell gallery, the public gallery one. But the idea is one should be able to set up internal galleries. That's something people have asked from enterprise perspective. I don't want everything on internet facing, so that's something. If you have questions, you can ask. Is yes. that okay? So on um, PowerShell get for down level? Good question. So the question is, uh, what about PowerShell uh, get on down level? Today it's only in WMF5, and that's also uh, work almost ready, -ish, where we have PowerShell uh, get as a down separate download for PowerShell 3 and PowerShell 4. Great. So that should come out. Yes, it, it should come out soon. Uh, it just testing the last bits yeah. and people who are MVPs, they, they have early bits to play and yeah. provide feedback. It might be a stupid question, but uh, no. what's the thinking of behind scripts versus modules? Why, why mm -hmm. what doesn't modules do? Do you want to answer? Uh, supporting for scripts on PowerShell gallery and why module is not good enough. So what module is not good enough? Right, yeah. why do people need scripts? Why are we doing scripts? <laughs> So if you look at um, the community, right, externally, if you take, take an example of TechNet Script Center itself, TechNet Script Center has a thousand modules and four thousand scripts in there. So mm -hmm. modules are for reusable uh, code. Like it's like you can relate uh, the content in module as an API, whereas script is like uh, your configuration script. Like I want to install SharePoint, but SharePoint can be installed in multiple different ways. So one, you can share different ways as different kinds of scripts, like configurations. Those can be as scripts. So the module is API. Script has one application, one form of application of using the API. Yeah, I think of it as like modules are like DLLs and yeah. scripts are like Gagsies. Yeah. You want them both. Would a good example of a good script to be out there would be like a workflow to like set up? Yeah, actually that's a great point. The, uh, you know, Azure Automation, right. Uh, does everything through workflow, and uh, yeah, they want to be able to share those, share them, find them. And, and the, the idea is essentially then, uh, whatever we make it available in PowerShell Gallery, you'll see in your automation and all the other places which leverages, they will start leveraging those things as well. So that's, that's one piece of PowerShell Gallery, and on the code sharing, um, you would have noticed already, we've talked about it multiple times, that a lot of DSC resources are out there on GitHub PowerShell uh, project, as well as we have a script analyzer there. And over time, you'll see more modules and more code that we have written internally, open source it. So we get feedback, we get uh, community contribution as well to make them well. Question. Do you make uh, dependencies and stuff? Good question. So the question is uh, dependency. So on, uh, I believe in the August uh, production preview, you have support when you install uh, modules, it, it can pull down the dependency as well. That was something we- But for scripts? For scripts, I don't, that's the same plan. Yes. So when, when script support is there, you'll get dependencies also. So Question. We'll share something when we are ready. Yes. Yeah, um, will you be, uh, well, at least thinking about open sourcing the DSC pool server? That's a good question, and uh, <laughs> yes, we are thinking about it. Uh, J we have blessing from Jeffrey on that. We still have to figure out the actual details <laughs> of uh, getting the resources, clean them up, put it out there. So, so why you ask? 
Uh, well, <laughs> yes. I want to. Well, I've, I've mostly built one already um, for version four to replace version four's one. Um, but version five obviously has a lot more things, and I figure I would try and ask if you could open source it rather than having to reverse okay. engineer. Just it. curious, because it is. Yeah, because well, there, there were some really cool things about it, but there, were, maybe there was a lot of room for improvement, which has been happened already. But okay, um, cool. Yes, so that that's work in progress. The legal side takes longer than actual putting okay. things out, so cannot say more. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you look at authoring, um, th there are specific enhancements in ISCs from a DSC perspective. If you and I'll, I'll show that d demo. Uh, where DSE offering becomes easier in ISC, and if you do a side-by-side -side comparison of ISC versus vi Visual Studio, that's what we have heard typically. People who are IT pros, they're good with ISC, <coughs> things are there. Uh, Stepping back, how many of you are aware that you can actually author PowerShell in Visual Studio now? So I have a PowerShell, PowerShell project and all that kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah. Question? I didn't see Visual Studio code on there. And yep. uh, Visual Studio as a package is much bigger as the new editor, the, the code. Yeah, the, the community the, version the, of it actually yeah. works with PowerShell now as yeah, well. Yeah, no, the community, the, yeah. the other, the editor that runs on OS X yeah. and Linux. Yeah. 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 And are you looking at making that experience better? I mean, it has some intelligence now. But so, um, go ahead. So the, they are the Visual Studio team is driving that work, and we, okay. we right now, the biggest uh, partnership we have is the, with PowerShell tools. Okay. So that's where they are adding support to create DSC configuration, adding support for modules. So all those templates are going to come in. Mm -hmm. And over time, I expect in code, things will light up okay. as well. Question. Our chief of development was uh, in uh, Visual Studio in the uh, US here. Yeah, and he called back and said, we need to make all of this uh, DSC and this. But when he then uh, came back, he, he, he showed us uh, this release management. And it's just uh, release management. What, what is that for? Uh, is it most? I'm an ops guy, so and mm -hmm. they are the development developments, yeah. And they are working in Visual Studio. Uh, but he wanted me to show how he used the release management because then he could deploy all his machines and everything from the, within inside uh, Visual Studio or the release management part of, of Visual Studio. So what's the question? Whether, so the, so DSC so the, whether the DSC configuration is authored in ISC or Visual Studio, it can still be used by the uh, release management. Yeah, and, and they want us, the ops guys, to know how Visual Studio in that release management uh, part is, is working. Uh, normally, we, we, if we uh, define a new uh, Hyper-V machine, we will do it uh, through our uh, ISE or something like that, but now we have to also know how the release management work is working. So I, I'm okay. just feeling yeah. like it's two teams that are pushing uh, technology, uh, some 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 management technology to the development guys, and and some uh, are pushing the ops uh, technology to us uh, in the ISE and uh, this. The way I the way I think about that is, yeah. you know, desired state configuration is a platform. Yeah. And then a number of solutions, solutions will be layered on top of that. Chef, Steve Morowski talked about that. That's a solution on top of it. Puppet, Guardrail, Aditi, and the Visual Studio Deployment Manager tool? Release Manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Release, Release Manager. Manager. That's another uh, solution layered on top of desired state configuration. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just, a, just another great tool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Any plans for source control integration? Uh, <laughs> I don't, at this point there's nothing that is, I can share about source control in ISC, but you, if there's feedback, we'll, we'll, we'll try to see it. I know people have asked for it before. It's, it's, it's it not. works though, it's not. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yes. Why don't you just open source, use an open source like Pesta, and put Git in? Yeah, Windows you can, yeah. I, yeah. I would say for source control, yeah. Get, GitHub or Git yeah, is, is yeah, the best one. That's, yeah. There's no re reason to reinvent the wheel there. Um, so in terms of uh, authoring, I'll just uh, go with ISC. And 
the only reason I show this is a lot of times people um, are not aware that all these functionalities are there and it helps your authoring. So first of all, I'm running the production preview of WMF5. So one thing you'll notice is you have support for a couple of more things like classes. We have built-in snippets or classes. You have built-in uh, snippets for DSC configuration data. So all nodes and all those stuff is there. And you have support for DSC resources classes. So they are there. Um, but if you are writing a configuration, and um, say for example you say file one which has so first of all you can go and do control space part here it shows you all the things about that resource so it's equivalent of doing get dsc resource finding its syntax and if it has validate set kind of things it even shows you what those values are so you can see created date modified date so that's one thing you should leverage and use because um, what did you press to get that Control space bar. Control space. Okay. Yeah, is that's that the shortcut. Actually, fill it in for you. Like, it mm. wants to show you. Um, it shows you. You can go here and oh. control space bar, and it'll tell you. So, if you want to use destination path, and you can just say C demo dot uh, txt, and depends on. There's not nothing to depend on. There, are, there are a couple of bugs here and there. You'll see. Um, so, there's nothing to depend on here. Show validates. So it works on the right hand side as well. And you can say check sure. some, and when you do this, it'll show you all the values. Does it show you which are the keys? Uh, not <coughs> inside it, but at this level, yes. It does uh, tell you with square brackets and without square bracket, like your uh, help function. Optional. So okay. this is uh, mandatory, and everything else is optional. That's so control space. Control, uh, yes. And one thing we want to do is in, inside here, if uh, I support, we want a way to indicate which one are mandatory versus optional. We haven't reached there and we haven't even thought was the right way because whatever you see here gets actually caught or typed for you. So how do we, <coughs> maybe a sh color shading well, might be do, an option. Do a file F2 and then show the depends on Yes, so that's we'll the next one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I'll just, Did that just auto-complete that? Which one? Uh, Windows feature. Yes, it will auto-complete those cool. uh, things. So here, when I complete, it will do anything with Windows, which is Windows process, Windows feature, and optional features. And then it goes back into DLLs and stuff. Another thing you can do it is. It will do that for custom resources as well. If you have any yeah. more statement up there, it will do all the custom resources that are in that. So cool. if I do the name for the feature. Yes, that's the uh, interesting. And when you do depends on, it actually sh tells you all the other f resources that you have. You can do depends on, and it's not only the ones that are on the top. <laughs> so you can actually here also say file F two destination path. back here and it'll show you things before and after as well. So you can write in any order, whatever makes sense, but it depends on you can make it happen in the right specific order. Uh, those are the big things I will call out. And lastly is on import, import DSC resource. Here you will see there's IntelliSense and you'll see there's module name and module version. So that module version was a specific thing we added. You have the support of doing the module, modif uh, module specification object with the hash table format on the module name, but that's inconvenient. So now you can say, I want this module with this specific version very easily rather than creating a hash table. So those are the three big things. Mm -hmm. Any questions? And most of it is already available, but it's just that people don't know it, so people don't use it. If you do name now, will it give you a list of all the things? No. no. Okay. Uh, right now it doesn't. Uh, we don't have a similar way of command ca uh, resource caching like we do with command caching. So once we have that, 
something we want to do for performance reasons and other. Once we do that caching, then it'll start giving you those lists automatically. One, one other question that's, I know it's bothered me since last, uh, the last uh, summit in, in Amsterdam. But import uh, DSC session, it looks like a command, but it's a keyword. Is it yes, bond, import DSC resource is a keyword. So is suspend workflow. So there are a couple of places we have introduced keywords. It looks like commandlet named dash word. That's how it is at this point. I, I for me, uh, it's yeah. sort of related to a performance problem that I see. With once you have that import uh, DSC resource, the parsing seems to go much slower in ISE, and I don't know if it's related. Okay. Uh, we had an earlier uh, discussion with somebody else, uh, also around this earlier. I don't know if that's something. It, I'm just wondering why, because there's certain there's certain keywords that look like commands or comments, and some this one looks like a commandlet, and so <coughs> it's very it's not intuitive for a non uh, PowerShell uh, DSC person. Yes, so I'm I, wondering what the thought was behind it. Sorry if I asked that so bluntly, but yeah. no, no, that's fine. Uh, it's, it's okay. I don't have a good answer why we ended up there. Uh, if Bruce was here, he would have given you the technical right. answer why. why I think the, the high level reason for it is that the name is one thing, why it has a dash in it, but we wanted it to be. Um, only makes sense inside of the configuration node. Outside of the configuration node, import DSC resource doesn't make sense. Um, so we wanted to limit the scope to inside of the configuration node. So, Because um, you do with classes, you do the same thing, right? There's certain things that are only inside the context of a class, and there it's not, they're not shown as commandlets. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to bring that yeah. up. But the other thing is, it's a commandlet, it can be overridden. There's a, it can be aliases take precedence yeah. over yeah. functions, etc. whereas keywords are always at the, the top. Yeah, I, I think the confusion is that it looks so much like a commandlet yeah. name, the format is the verb name. So here's the thing, that's a good thing. So what, the only difference between a keyword and a commandlet is, in the cases where you're gonna screw yourself, it doesn't let you screw yourself. <laughs> so if you really want to screw yourself, you're out of luck. <laughs> and, uh, a way to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you, can yes. you show the depends on once more? I apologize. Sure. I was taking notes. So on, if you go on depends on and yeah, I can't get it to tap it, control space bar. Well, control space. Yes. Yeah. So it's a control space bar all every place where you are. Can you do that twice? But you said also it was a pre it's a different version that we don't, it's not released as a preview yet? No, this one is all there. The only thing I, is new is the module version, which mm -hmm. is, which is there in August uh, production preview, but not on Windows 10 build, the Windows 10 RT build. So August production, this is running on uh, August production preview. There's nothing new there. Question. So just to, uh, Avoid confusion. Windows 10 preview builds <laughs> WMF5 previews. Can we install the WMF5? I've, I've not tried it. Can you install the previews on Windows 10 preview builds, or should we so, just stick with whatever comes in there? So WMF is specifically for down level systems. Uh, whatever we have in WMF5 uh, production preview will work only on down level systems. So it's not for Windows 10. The plan is whenever the next a big update of Windows 10 will come, uh, you will have all this functionality available in Windows 10. So in Windows 10, ignore the uh, WMF module. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, our thought and that's what we blogged about is when we do Windows 10 uh, WMF 5 RTM, you it should coincide with a big update on Windows 10. So at that point, <laughs> everything is same. You can install. Is that coming? You said. I said. I think on the blog, uh, Q4 of 2015 is when we are expecting to release with WMF5 RTM. I don't know what Windows 10. <laughs> okay. So back to. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing about is classes. So that's another thing which makes life faster, and I'll try to keep this demo, or I'm, I might skip the demo uh, and cover the other ones. Uh, so the big reason, there are two big reasons of doing classes is first of all, doing all the moth based uh, DSC resources in multiple files and keeping everything in sync hurts everybody's head. We knew it when we released it, we didn't have enough time to do the classes work completely and correctly along with DSC to have it out. Now we said, we have time, do it. So that's one reason. and. If you look at the number of items you have to manage with 
in a class-based resources, that's three times lesser. For every resource, you get equal in one file with class-based resources, but when you go with the mock-based resources with files and folder structures and all those things, you end up three times more. So I, I, there's a formula I did, it's like three N plus four versus N plus two. So it's about the same of my, um, uh, order of magnitude. And the other piece is, whenever we talk with developers, whether it's inside Microsoft or outside, they said, I get, I love PowerShell and all those things, but I have to make a mental switch from my C sharp when I go and try to do PowerShell. There are certain things which are different, a scripting language is dynamic, and written statement behaves differently, I, sometimes you don't have to type. So with classes, the idea is we, we want to make that transition for developers easier, and then makes the DevOps uh, story even better because they are both using the same kind of tools. And the last piece is the nano server. On nano server, people typically create types using either a PS custom object or add type. Add type is not going to be a nano server, at least it's not there at this point because core CLR doesn't have those things. Uh, so the idea there is you will use classes to create your custom types. So those are the two or three big motivations around doing classes work. Um, if you have played with classes, uh, then there's nothing new except one thing which I, so you have now the uh, snippet. Classes are just, you're creating a type. Type has properties and methods. And there's syntax about it. it almost identical to C-sharp, um, you can do it. <coughs> There's one uh, limitation today, even in August production preview, is uh, when you define a class or a type inside a module, there's no easy way to get it from outside the module. It's available only there. There is a um, not so widely explained feature you can get internal properties, internal types from a module. It's a very complex, or it looks little, it hurts your head a bit, uh, the syntax. Um, and I'll just show you briefly. Um, this is the difficult one. So assume there is a type defined called my car in a module. You have to actually say get module, the name of the module, and then define the type. At this point, you have access to the type. So you have that access and then you can call a new on it and create an instance. So this is one way that existed in PowerShell 3, PowerShell 4, but it's it hurts everybody's head. So uh, and did you, mention the did you mention the invoke operator? That's the key part. Yes. Okay. I didn't hear that. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yes, you have to invoke uh, that expression and you says get the module and then invoke and find the type. Is so everybody this, familiar with that? What that does is invoke and a, and a module says execute the script blocks in the context of the module. So that's what you do and you get in the class there and then you get it outside, you have the reference. And you can use the same thing if there's internal functions. You can access those internal functions. What did you introduce that? Uh, with modules. So yeah, it, it's there in version <laughs> three. <laughs> version one. No. 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 Um, and you can access the internal functions also inside a module. If there are internal functions, you can say within that module scope, give me that function. Uh, that's but now you're just getting the type, right? Right now, yes. Yeah. You, you are just getting the access to the type. You so cannot use system. in casting or arguments. You're just getting an access to the type. And then you have to instantiate a instance of that type and do the card. Does it mean you're running that in the scope of the module? You could assign variables as well? Yeah, yes. it's bad. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Oh yeah. So how is this different from a uh, dot sourcing? Is it? Any, I mean. So. Um, that's a script. I mean, it's also you're removing the scope for the dot source and you say no. I'm, it's it's, no it's different. Anymore. It's different from dot sourcing. When you do a dot sourcing, everything that is exported from the module is available outside. Mm -hmm. This is a way to get things which are not exported from the module by default. And like with a manifest for a module, you have is there going to be a is there, I know you can do aliases, functions, blah, blah, blah. Is there a classes in the new manifest for modules? No, so uh, types to exports, um, not types to export. By default, if you define any type, uh, when you import the module, the type is uh, exported. There's no way to hide a specific type. So that that's a current way, uh, but. I've got a question. Go ahead. But that's just for modules. If you run a script now, right. um, unlike the earlier preview versions, you can 
the, the type is available in, if you run a script in a session, the type is now available in the session, you can instantiate objects in the session. That wasn't available in the early previews, it's right. available in yeah. And you can use new object now. Yes, new object, yeah, th that was one thing. Uh, and essentially, we are, this is the syntax, uh, I don't have the right things, or I'm defining multiple times, but we are now exposing that you don't have this one, this is coming in the future. <coughs> now you can do kind of a namespacing, you said, using module this, That's and great. I have two modules, which is my car and your car, and both of them implement a car interface. Is it using also applied to .net names, all .NET namespaces in? So I don't have to write out the long... I have not played with it, but yeah, idea it's, it's because it's modules. All those DLLs and namespaces, they mm -hmm. so just... Any, any assembly basis. Yes. The thinking mm -hmm. behind using is very, very deep, okay. and it'll be delivered in stages, because there's a lot... There's a lot more to do there. Uh, not everything will light up in the arcing time. Yeah. So these ones look like inheritance there. Can you do interfaces as well? Yes. Oh yes, so um, you can do uh, inheritance with classes yes. and uh, you can do, you can use interfaces. You, so here is, you implement your uh, own interface by using uh, system item variable and then you can use it from this. So but that is one example. You can't make it generic and use the... Yeah. You can't. Not yet, at least. Not, not generic. Uh, oh, generic. Generics, yeah. yeah I'm, I don't think it's there. You, you can use generics, but not using the class you implemented as a type parameter. Right. Right. As an ops guy, I might need five minutes. All this, I just changed the naming of the classes, and everything is from the uh, production preview release notes. I just copied it because I know not everybody reads all the release notes all the way through, but uh, these examples are just posted wherever we put it, and they are there. So there's a notion of virtual classes, um, or virtual methods and base methods, and uh, so the big idea is this is the new way, and in this case you have my car and your car, so I'll actually I'll just run it. Um, so I have two modules, both implement the same thing. When you run it, it'll say sorry, it's ambiguous because both of them implement uh, car, you have to specify. So here it says car is ambiguous, it could be either my car dot car or your car dot car. So, so as you're, you're moving towards this more um, PowerShell, the question I think is, well, where's going to be a dividing line between C sharp and PowerShell? Why do we need a dividing line? That's my question. Yeah. That's, yeah. that, that, that's, how, that's how we are heading. It's like people who are developers who have been doing things very easily with mm -hmm. C sharp, when they come to PowerShell, they don't say, oh, it's different, my head hurts, I don't want to do it. So you're almost talking just about a transparent way. Right. Yeah. So it's moment. easy for them to move, but at the same time, when IT pros, they want to go to C sharp kind of stuff, mm -hmm. they can easily do it because they know PowerShell, they know oh, it's a keyword, I have to use class, and magic flows. Yeah, we've always wanted to have a, a tool that allowed you to go from, you know, kind of simple admin to sophisticated systems programming and to bring together the two communities. <coughs> now the implementation behind them, we have very different philosophies. C Sharp <coughs> is all about optimizing the computer resources, mm -hmm. and PowerShell is all about optimizing the human resources. Mm -hmm. So that's why you know we spend a lot of cycles to get pipelining to work and make all the magic that you get out of PowerShell. That requires a lot of uh, uh, code to make work. Uh, if you were a systems programmer, C Sharp's a better thing to do with it. Yeah, I've had these discussions with developers before, and I mean, a lot of the problems that they uh, they hit up against are, I'm wondering how you're going to address this, uh, are this first what I call the automagic of, uh, or the mystique of PowerShell, you know, the automatic conversion, which is lovely. And I love it. I use it for validators all the time. I don't have to do a validation script. I just cast it. If it doesn't cast, I get an exception. But for them, it's it's hard to, they're in the strict mode, right? Strict type. And that's a really hard thing, uh, you know, assigning of, I mean, of course, you can put, uh, uh, exactly. You put classes in front of or have type, type, type variables right. and stuff like that, but then if, if they are complaining uh, bad way, then they're not writing the code that they are used to writing in C sharp. Yeah. Because if you put the type literal before a variable name, uh, then it's a strong. It's more a re reuse of code, though. Is what I'm talking about. So okay. They have a huge yeah. PowerShell uh, gallery out there, and then they're going to take in code. They don't want to have to rewrite that and, and put types in front of all the variables. Uh, 
because there are two different, like you were saying, there are two different worlds of the, the scripters who learn to adapt, and some people, some partial scripters don't know objects yet. They just they use the abstraction right. to their advantage, and it's wonderful. But then once you need to start, once you think about it, what's actually going on under the covers, then it becomes difficult. I, I think that's where the script analyzer kind of tool will help to say, hey, I want to enforce these rules, and some places as an IT pro, I don't care about those rules kind of thing. Uh, that's the best I can think at this point, and that's... I'd say, I'd say 98% of the time, the conversions that PowerShell does is exactly what you want to do, and it saved you from writing a bunch of crap code which you often get wrong and frustrates the hell out of you. And a couple times that isn't the case, but, and so they just no, have, no, to, like, wonder, they just have to get their head no, through the knot hole and accept the <laughs> gift. <laughs> no, I've, okay. had, I've had talks where I've, I've had developers in there and they say, I hate PowerShell. And then I said, okay, that's my challenge to make you love it. And in the end, they always do. Uh, but it's still, there's still those out there that don't get to have those conversations. And they, yeah. 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 But they have an alternative way to automate things, right? So I think the real value of PowerShell is giving the tools of automation to people who didn't have Mm. Sure. So uh, we'll, we'll move ahead. I think we are sure. very short on time. Yeah, this is fine. <laughs> so that's the classes part, and then I'll let. All right. So we've got through the part. authoring part. I'm going to chat a little bit about the testing part now. Um, how many of you uh, have used or played with um, <coughs> test or script analyzer? Okay. It's the first time everybody in the room didn't raise their hand. Um, so you I'm going to talk. Asked any other questions? I asked you. Yeah, I don't think so. Have you used classes is not a question, <laughs> or not an easy question. But um, So basically, I'm going to chat about debugging. Um, well, the first thing you do when you start testing is debugging. You build your script, you start debugging, stuff like that. I'm not going to go through a lot of the stuff I had planned, because Tobias just killed it this morning on the debugging. Um, so I'm going to show you one specific example of debugging. All the stuff that he talked about, um, I was gonna talk about as well, but Aww. he actually, no, he did a really good job. I actually was like, wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so basically with the debugging, you can debug scripts. Um, so you can hit control B, it'll break into a script or else, while it's running very easily. You can debug a script remotely. You can remotely edit a, um, a script and then start debugging it and stuff like that. And Tobias showed all that stuff, really, really cool work. Um, then he got into the um, PowerShell host process and the run spaces and things like that. Um, I'm kind of kind of build on that, and where that kind of comes to is allowing you to debug DSC resources. So you build a resource now um, and to debug it. The way that a lot of people have done it is import module. So I import the resource and then I run test DSC resource or get DSC resource or whatever. The problem with that is it's running in the user's context, and when DSC runs, it's running in system context, so you can get an issue when you're applying a configuration and not be able to debug it, because when I run it, it works, but when I run the configuration, it doesn't work. Um, you think you're doing the exact same thing, but there's some different context there. So what um, enter PS host process and enter um, or debug run space allow you to do is start a configuration and then start debugging that configuration with DSC. Um, so this is just a high level overview of what run spaces are. How many of you are familiar with run spaces? All right. Um, so basically, run space runs inside a session. You can have multiple run spaces. Um, so when you start ISE, you have different um, different tabs of ISE. You'll have different run spaces in there. So or you have the different connections there. So you can have multiple run spaces within a session. Um, do a quick demo here of debugging DSC. It's um, not the right one. Um, so with DSC, that's all the cool stuff that Tobias did and better. Um, in DSC, uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start a configuration um, over on another system. We have a virtual machine. I'm going to start in a PowerShell window, a DSC configuration. So I'm going to launch the window, connect to that machine. And this command right here, this enable DSC break all, allows you to basically, when a DSC configuration runs, um, instead of having to go into that DSC resource and do wait debug in the resource and have it stop, this allows you to say, for that system over there, I want to turn on debugging. So when DSC runs, when it gets to my resource, script resource, it'll stop. 
wait for me to connect to that thing, and then I can start debugging that resource. So what this is going to do is put the system in the state that I want it to be in, kick off DSC, and it'll sit there and wait for me to actually connect to it. And I'll show you the cool thing that we did in DSC. Window, the tab open for 10 minutes. Yeah, one more. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, and this is the configuration that's over on the other system. So it's just a really simple configuration. It sets an environment variable and makes sure that a service is running. I just wanted to show kind of the, the resources that you have over there with that configuration. So I'll go ahead and run that guy. Opens the window. It'll connect to that system, hopefully. And start running the configuration. And I wanted to set this up so the verbose and warning messages were different colors, but I did not get the time to do that. Um, so you can see down here at the bottom, you would have a warning message that should be a different color, but it's not. Um, and it tells you what you need to do to actually connect to that thing. So it says DSC is stopped, it's not running anymore, it's waiting for a debugger. And this is how you go connect to it and run it. Um, so you connect to that other system over there. And I think. I will come over here and enter DS session, connect to it, and then grab this guy. And what this does is says, this is the host or the process ID and the app domain that you want to connect to. So it tells you how to actually connect to that process, the DSC process that's running. So I'll copy that and paste that over here. Then I'll connect to that process inside of DSC in the LCM. And then I will tab back up here and grab the last bit. Now it says, I want to start debugging this thing. This resource it stopped at the initial execution of DSC resource. I'll connect to that. And it'll actually Ooh. pop up Ooh. in ISC. So I can start <laughs> that. So it takes advantage of all of the cool stuff that we did under the hood where you can connect to those processes, connect to the run spaces, and view it all in the ISC. And you can do that with the DSC resources. So it allows you to F10 to step through this thing, and you can hit breakpoints there, you can edit the file over there, and all that kind of stuff. Save it, rerun it, and make sure that your fixes are working and all that kind of stuff. Now you're running in system context. Yes. Yep. And that's what one of the things Tobias said. Now you have a window in system context, you can do cool things there. <laughs> is this only available in ISV? I, I, I know you're making a lot of headway with uh, Visual with Visual Studio. Do you see that? Um, that's a there? good question. So yes, um, it's it's going to light up in Visual Studio. Yeah. We have the APIs are public. There was one specific work we had to do make sure they can leverage it. So that work the collaboration is still happening. So I don't think when it's going to light up, but it's going to light up. Cool. So they're public. Yes, yeah, so they're available for yes. other hosts. Yes, it's, it's, they are public APIs, so any, any host can use them. Uh, All right, um, so that experience is not the best experience in the world, having to copy and paste that stuff between them. That is something that we're working on. Jeffrey has beat us up about that quite a bit. Um, <laughs> but it is it, it gets the base information down there, get the base um, processes there so you can actually do the debugging, work through it, and all that kind of stuff. But we do want to make it so you can actually stop right into the debugger. You don't have to figure out the process ID and all that kind of stuff. So and all the information those three lines gives you, you can find it by saying get uh, PS source process and get run space. You can find all those information, but obviously that's extra work. So we did first step of making it easier. The next step would be you don't have to know all this. You just run one command and run your configuration, debug it. And gives you, and you can select which resource you want to debug on. So that's the full view we want to do, it's just the time. <coughs> All right, I've got five minutes, so I'm gonna jump back here to deck. So that's debugging, um, really powerful stuff, great stuff you can do. Um, script analyzer is um, downloadable from the module store now. The current version is 1.1. It was released earlier, earlier this month. Um, it gives you the ability to do code analysis on scripts and modules. Um, so you can basically run the thing, and I'll show you what you can do there, and make sure that um, it... You're telling us to stop already. All right, um, 
So there's script analyzer, which does code analysis, and then there's pester, which allows you to define unit tests and integration tests and actually test your modules and configurations and all that kind of stuff. Um, so if I go back here, I will do a really fast demo and show you both of those things. So script analyzer here, um, I think I have the module imported already, so that stuff's already done. Um, you can basically, there's a get script analyzer, which allows you to see all of the rules that are um, applying on the system. So you can see all of the rules that are applied, or that will apply and do checks against. It gives you the name of the rule, what type of rule it is, if it's an error information or warning, and then a description about what it's going to check there. So these are the built-in ones. You can do custom ones as well, and I'll show you that. Um, but it gives you the ability to actually see what the rules are. You can look for a specific rule. You can look for all of the rules of a specific type. And then you can actually view here a custom rule. So if you have a custom rule defined, you can actually take a look at that and see what the custom rule is. Show you the custom rule. That'll give you the ability to actually say, I want to see the custom rule there. The custom rule in this case, um, I actually don't have it up, but you can define a custom rule and look at that. Um, if you come down here to invoke script analyzer, you can actually invoke it on a path and then do recursive. So it's going to check all of your scripts um, locally and tell you the results of those. So it'll run through and tell you. The custom rules, question? do you have them posted somewhere? Because I was looking Yeah, I have all of this stuff that I'll check in on GitHub and show you. So. Um, so it runs through and tells you which rules are passing and failing for all of the scripts on your system. Um, so it gives you the warnings that are applying for each of the scripts and modules. Um, all right. So that's doing the invoke script analyzer on all of the scripts in your environment. You can say which rules you want to exclude. So if you are getting a bunch of internal URLs, which this is one I was running into for my scripts, I wanted to hard code the URLs. And one of the rules is don't do that. Um, I think we're getting the axe here, but um, <laughs> Don, is, Don is the hammer. You can go for um, the Don. So you can say what rules to exclude, what rules to include. Um, and then this is kind of cool down here, the profile. You can define a profile so if you want only to see warnings and you have specific um, rules that you want to see. You can define your profile and then reference that profile and that will be used each time you run the thing so you don't have to put all of the different parameters there. Um, and the last one is Pester, really quickly, and then I'll hit the button. Um, Pester allows you to actually run tests against so you define a test and then you can run Pester and it'll run the tests on all of the scripts in your environment. So if you have questions, feel free to yell afterwards or we'll show you out in the lobby. Just to add to this, I'm doing a talk on the script analyzer, so okay. for, sorry about my bad questions.